Hello everybody and welcome back, finally, finally, to Space's Hard Vacuum, Episode 5 with Cerberus. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about why it's been so long. It's certainly not for lack of trying. Um, it's just for, for the last week now, almost every day, I have spent uh, two hours trying to get something, you know, worth showing. Even... Not necessarily a, a perfect launch or anything like that, just something worth showing. Uh, and it just wasn't happening. I mean, between... It was one thing or another. I mean, it was, you know, a design flaw or something where... Um, I, you know, I'd not take something into account and the rocket wouldn't work, or... I'd do the staging wrong, or... Um, I would fly it wrong, um, or... Something else wacky would happen, or I'd, I'd just get plain unlucky. And it really was like it was a string. It was if it it was one of those times where if it wasn't something, it was something else, and if it wasn't that, it was something else again. Like here, I decouple and I go to stage, and nothing. The fairings came off, and that was it. So then I go and I and I go and I fix it. Because the connection nodes weren't done quite right. I go and I fix that. Oh, okay, all right. Well, we'll we'll try it again. And uh, th this one as a bit of a spoiler. This one I believe went okay. This launch. Um, it was the same thing again. And what this is now that this one's actually going to you know get there and do its thing. Uh, it's a comps app. I'm. I suppose I'm starting. Um, to put together a bit of a communication satellite network around Earth, if for no other reason than because of the fact that I was just not having any luck, as you will see later in this video, no luck whatsoever uh, trying to complete the biological sample recovery mission. Um... I even had some trouble with that thing, uh, getting it into a good orbit, which was, again, it was another one of those things where it was just bad luck, you know, a lag spike at the wrong time, you know, the little rendering lag causes the mech jab or the rocket gimbal to go nuts and flip the rocket over, just stuff like that, just stupid stuff like that. And uh, look, see, there, the stage came off properly, we're... <laughs> We're doing better than the last launch already. Um, yeah, the the bio sample recovery probe. I've I spent, I think I think it was four evenings last week, uh, tweaking the design of the probe, tweaking the design of the rock of the rocket, and then I would go and I would launch. And you know, there was once there was something happened. Uh, while launching, while getting into orbit, and most of the other times I got into an orbit, but then couldn't get the thing home safely. Um, I'm still working on trying to tweak that design um, to get it to a point where it's actually going to behave like I want it to as it comes down to the atmosphere. It's obviously, of course, it has a heat shield, but it's just a matter of getting it to fly down through the atmosphere heat shield first. Which you think is kind of easy, but nothing is quite that easy when you have the realistic aerodynamics setup that I have. But anyway, back to this, uh, back to this Comsat. This is the, it actually is just called the Comsat Mark I, because I do love Mark numbering all of the things that I build. And it's got, I think this one, yep, there we go. It's got four of these omnidirectional antennas that I like quite a bit, though believe, oh, okay, it seems I have decided to deploy only one of them, probably due to uh, electrical charge concerns, I believe was the problem with this. I, uh, Of course, getting up into orbit as well, I can't face it optimally into the sun like I'd want to, although it looks like I'm doing that now, because I'm taking the upper stage with me, it, I think, is what's going to happen, so that I can use the last of its fuel to help me circularize this orbit. I'm trying to get this one into it's not a geostationary orbit because it's it's on an inclination you know the just the kind of the standard inclination that you will fall into launching from the uh, 
launching from Cape Canaveral. It's like a 29 degree inclination approximately. So it's not actually geostationary. It, it will oscillate north and south, but that, that's basically what it would look like. Wherever it's going to end up, looking up into the sky, you'd actually just see it drift north and south throughout the day. But, you know, that's not still not so bad. I wanted to get it up to the altitude. I didn't necessarily need it to be absolutely geostationary. As long as it's up there, um, helping to be a bit of a relay for other probes I'm going to send up later. And I put some of the dish antennas on this one on top of the omnidirectional ones, though it seemed pretty obvious to me at this point that I needed more or better solar panels or both to actually have everything running at once because uh, those omnidirectionals use... It doesn't look like much. It's like 0 0.02 charge per second. But there's only 200 charge in the probe core that I'm using. I don't have any extra batteries on this design. And so the, the solar panels I have are generally all still fairly weak. So it actually doesn't take much to... Uh, uh, overtax the capacity of your solar panels. Here we are using the last little bit of the fuel in there, and I think I should have decoupled this by now, but I'm looking at it thinking, geez, these thrusters aren't firing, but it was using up the MMH fuel I had for them. And I think that's just uh, a property where if you run out of fuel or oxidizer, but your rocket engine is still throttled up, it's still going to spit Whatever you have left out the rocket nozzle, you're just not going to get the fire and the, you know, uh, propulsion out of it. As it is, I do believe this one gets up into orbit just fine, though. And now that I'm at a better angle with the sun, I've got the second antenna out, so I've got at least some a little bit of a rabbit ear thing going on. Although the other two, the other two are not totally dormant. Uh, these are the ones where they do provide some, they have some gain, they provide some use, even when they're retracted. So they are kind of adding a little bit to the total uh, antenna power of this probe when they're retracted, just not a whole lot. Finishing up the orbit there with the RCS thrusters, which is, I, I still, I, I just love that. Um... It, it, it just helps with, indirectly, the thing that I like is that it helps with keeping space kind of clean. You don't have to have an upper stage rocket all the way up there with you at your apoapsis to finish your orbit, which you then ditch and then have drifting around forever, doing nothing except possibly crashing into other things. Um just with with the setup where the game or mech job or whatever is smart enough so that if you have no engine engine active like an actual traditional rocket engine it'll fire up the rcs and do its best to move you where you want to go and so I, I i tend to use that on purpose to have probes like this uh finish off their orbits and now i'm i don't remember exactly what i was doing here i'm just uh I think just checking on how good the signal was to various points on the Earth. And the nice thing about having the dish on there is, in theory, because it's got it's just it just sweeps a cone essentially. Anything that's within its cone of effect and that has the range or the gain or the power to communicate with it, it'll pick it up. So things that I have the idea was that things that I have in orbit, uh, any kind of very low orbit, you can see that cone there is. It's fairly wide compared to the planet. You can get, I'd say, at least a few thousand kilometers high into orbit, and provided you're on the right side of the planet to begin with, this satellite is supposed to be able to see you. And that is that is how it should work. Um, the only thing is that it's not going to work quite as close to the planet as I thought it would. Or, more accurately, it's not going to make it any easier for me uh, to keep up communication with uh, basically a probe that I have re-entering. I sent this up to maybe try and help make things easier with that biosample recovery probe so that when it was overhead I would schedule my descent for that side of the planet or whatever and um, basically just have it relaying because the dish 
has a range of 400,000 kilometers it can reach the moon. So it can definitely reach anywhere on the Earth. And I was going to have it, you know, whether the dish was going to pick up the biosample probe or the Omni antennas were going to pick it up, doesn't matter. And then the dish was going to kind of relay back to whatever ground stations it could see. I'm just checking on that there now. And then I noticed something else that seems like the dish isn't always talking to everything. And I start to think, okay, well, I wonder if maybe it actually has to be facing its target now. I don't recall that ever having been the case. From what I remember, you just you set up the dish, you have it target whatever, and as long as it's within range and within its cone, and the cone just points out whatever you're targeting, anything that's in that cone and in range and in the same sphere of influence, uh, from what I remember, it just it picked up. But I was seeing there on the night side of Earth, it wasn't really talking to everything. So that's me here just, you know, messing around a little more. I try to change the way the satellite's facing. Um, I turn on the other dish antenna. I'm not sure if I've done that yet. I may have missed that as I'm, I'm re-watching and providing commentary. In any case, I think I just ended up being satisfied enough for now and yeah i just said okay let me just let's just get on with it and here we go this is the rocket intended intended to carry the biosample recovery probe up in orbit and it is called uh the the acronym is r-o-s-s-t um and the reason why it's r-o-s-s-t is because this probe is part of the, of course, it's part of the realistic progression tech tree, and the story behind that, I guess, is that the, you know, a team of Swedish scientists uh, want us to send up some biological samples, some microbes or something, and see what space does to them. And because it's Swedish, it's R-O-S-S-T, regular, ordinary Swedish science time. A few of you may get it. Most of you probably won't. Uh, check YouTube for a series, I don't think it's active anymore, but you'll see all of the videos they did, called Regular Ordinary Swedish Mealtime, which itself was a knockoff of, um, I believe, a, a, group of, a group of Canadian guys who did Epic Mealtime, which is much better known. Probably, uh, at, least, at least a few of you are going to, uh, I don't really know what that is. So, regular, ordinary Swedish science time, provided I can actually get it home. And, uh, as a spoiler, I don't do that this time either. Well, maybe I should just sit here in silence and let you guys watch now, because I've told you how it ends. But, um, you know, I mean, I... I have, uh... I think right now, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to circularize that apoapsis, that kind of thing, and that's that's standard, standard procedure. That all goes fine. I've only done this about six or seven times with the exact same rocket now, so, that, you know, usually it goes pretty okay. And we'll get up into orbit, and um, even at four times acceleration, or it's not four times time acceleration in-game, but I've sped up the video by a factor of four. And even with that, now that I've skipped right to how it ends, now I have to fill this time talking about something else. Um, hmm. Well, actually, what I can do is maybe explain, maybe foreshadow a little bit how this is going to be a problem. You can you can see there from the various angles you've gotten of that probe up top that it's you know it's it's modeled on the it uses the uh, the cube the probodobodyne cube QBE uh, probe core model which is not very aerodynamic and it has a heat shield and a fuel tank underneath it neither of which are very aerodynamic either and so it has to basically fall down through the atmosphere heat shield first Otherwise, what's the point of having carried that 110-kilogram heat shield up here with me in the first place? 
And so, you know, I've, I've messed with the design a few times. That, what you're seeing there now is, I don't know what version it is. I, most of the changes have been pretty minor. I think what you'll probably see in, I'm hoping the next episode, I'm hoping I can finally pull this off, is there's probably going to be a major redesign. Um, I may even try using a smaller heat shield and making like a conic tank to sort of give a little bit of a, well, to give, to give a bit of that cone shape. And hopefully I can get it to a point where the heat shield is going to take literally the heat and not cause the cone-shaped tank to be destroyed and have, have the narrow end on the, on the heat shield and the wide end, you know, underneath the probe. I've also toyed with maybe having the fuel tank up on the top because by the time we get to re-entry, it's probably going to be at least mostly empty. Uh, and so then the center of mass might shift down toward the heat shield, which will help it at least a little bit point heat shield first as it falls through the atmosphere. Um, the other issue, of course, is that I, I do try to... I use whatever SES fuel is left for as long as I can, which is why it's been such a hard time for me trying to maintain communication throughout the descent, even after I retract that antenna and have the shorter range on it. And I, I do manage that in this one at least until the... I think I... Yeah, I think I manage communication all the way until the point where it all goes wrong. Because it's not the communication that fails me on this flight, it's the aerodynamics. And I'm, I mean, you're basically dropping... It's it's like you're throwing a rock from space into the atmosphere. It's It's difficult to throw it and then try to tell it exactly which way to orient itself as it falls through all that time and all that air and all that re-entry fire and goodness. And then I got the crazy idea, well, you know, why don't I just make it spin really fast? <laughs> I, I didn't... It's not that I was especially naively confident that I'd be able to, you know, spin stabilize this thing. But, you know, the idea occurred to me and I thought, whatever. At this point, why not try it? I've tried enough other things. Why not try this too? And at least if it doesn't work, I'll know it doesn't work and I won't try it again. But again, as you already know, because I've spoiled it for you, it doesn't work. It seemed for a while like it might work. Um, because when I started doing the spin, it was because I was noticing a little bit of a like a pitch oscillation at an altitude of like 100 kilometers when there's still practically no air around. And I was thinking, oh, geez, this thing's just going to flip over. And it's, that that's it. You know, it's once it flips, once it flips away from being faced heat shield first, it, you'd never get it back. Um, not without, I would need one of KSP, a stock KSP's OP reaction wheels to have a chance of getting it back to facing basically retrograde once it's, fallen away. It, it basically just falls sideways. Which you'll probably see, but I'll try to explain as best I can, because, you know, it's nighttime as we're descending here, and see this, this yeah, that pitch oscillation just turned into a roll oscillation, and then it's all gone wrong. Now it's facing sideways, and yeah, it's, see, it's just... Now the heat shield is... I don't want to say it's acting like a wing, but I mean, basically you have a flat-ish surface and you're trying to turn that big flat surface into the wind, which is no longer an issue because it's just fallen off due to aerodynamic stress. And then everything else starts to blow up due to heat stress. And yeah, from here, it's pretty much all over. Poof. So, we sent up the next one. Actually, we don't send up the next one. This is this is totally different. I gave up again on the biosample probe thing uh, for the time being, and I've just decided, okay, you know what? Let's let, let let's fo let's focus on more communication satellites. I can apparently do 
commsats right now. <laughs> I seem to fail uh, pretty damn hard at returning a probe from space, so let's just put some more satellites into orbit. The drawback is commsats don't give you any science, but I guess they're an investment. Eventually I'm going to need them for other things that I put up into space. Another, uh, I guess, maybe slightly interesting thing here is that um, for this launch, we've moved to a launch site that, well, we're a little bit far away from it at this point, but I had moved to a launch site uh, that I hadn't used before, and that is right there, Plesetsk in Russia. And the reason why we're up there is initially I was just, okay, well, we're it's it's 60-something degrees north uh latitude, so I'll have a high inclination orbit. And then after launching and just pitching over like I normally do, I realized, oh, okay, I'm facing like south-southwest. And I saw my inclination climbing even more. I thought, ooh, I can do a polar orbit. So that's what we have here now. We also have, as you can see there, the ComSat Mark II, which is... It's it's actually it's it's a uh, I've shaved some weight off of the Comsat one. I've added some more and better solar panels, and I've you know I've reconfigured things around. You can see that the I no longer have rabbit ear omni antennas. They're down there near the bottom, and then the rocket does its usual thing when I try to give it a a, a mechjeb smartass command to have it you know, set a course manually or semi-manually, uh, that um, MechJab making, MechJab behaving better with uh, with roll control uh, can't come soon enough. It's not, it's not really MechJab, though. It's, it's the, the gimbals on basically almost all of the, uh, of the rocket engines in my current mod setup. When you want them to, when you want your vehicle to roll, the gimbal on the rocket engine will usually it will it will yaw. Whereas, what I would prefer is if a rocket engine can't help you roll, it would just do nothing. However, when you when you just set a, a heading, well, a, a heading and a pitch and a roll all at the same time with the smart ass window. It's kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it just sends your rocket flipping around all over the place. At least, I mean, luckily I was already in space. I was already well on the way to having a decent orbit. So I just, I shut it down. Got the RCS to write it again and was on my way. It, you know, there was some wasted fuel, some wasted time. And in the end, that may have been what sort of prevented... Uh, this from working as well as I had wanted it to. However, I think I had also just been a little bit ambitious with the design uh, of the rocket itself, which was a bit of a scaled-down version of the Comsat Mark I's launch rocket. I just removed the boosters, made the tanks a bit smaller. Uh, I was going for a 15,000-kilometer circular orbit. You can see that we're up here now. And then the RCS has to fire up because I run out of fuel. And that takes a while... But eventually, uh, after it was, it was a few minutes. It was, I think, about five minutes, and then we run out of RCS, and we aren't still aren't quite there. But the at least I'm, I'm out of RCS. I can't even turn the probe anymore. But at least it's facing the sun well, so its electric charge is not an issue uh, with all those great big solar panels. So we're into I think 15 by I don't know 12 point something megameters, I believe. Watching on the preview that I'm watching it on, I, I can't actually read the MechJeb displays. So I leave it there. It seems like it'll work generally all right. So, hey, it's not on a perfect orbit, but it's still in orbit, and it'll still be a calm relay no matter where it is. So then after having it uh, orbit around a little bit there, I realized that I'd missed my six-hour window to launch the next one, which you see here. Uh, basically at right angles to the first one, so 
I went for the 18-hour window, which is why it's nighttime. Sorry. But, um, you know, it's a rocket launch. Unfortunately, you know, you can't get another view of the rich, lush, green landscape of highly pixelated, low-resolution, texture-optimized Russia, northern Russia. But, you know, I'm sure we'll see it again one of these days, and it's... Eh. You've seen it once, you've seen it a thousand times. Like I said, we will see it again. And we'll also see if this probe here can get to a slightly less ambitious orbit. There's no changes to the rocket. I didn't add any fuel, none of that. Um, this is the exact same as the one that we just saw launch. And so, having seen the orbit I was able to manage, uh, including using up all the RCS on the probe, I decided to go for 12,500 kilometers. Since that was... I got the periapsis almost that high on an apoapsis of 15,000 kilometers, so I thought, well, we'll try for 12,500 circularized. And now I'm got the attitude adjustment settings open again because I'm fighting with fighting with Mechcheb again. I've I've had a I've had some bad luck with that too. It's just doesn't it hasn't seemed it doesn't seem to have been as good at attitude control and like just maintaining a, a, a heading. It it seems to seems to want to drift a little bit and then it goes oh 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 well, sorry I was having a nap and then it points back where it tries to point back where it and then it overcompensates. It's been quite frustrating. Uh, so I every couple of flights I end up dinking around with those settings to try to make it work better. I might just have to look for uh, an updated dev build of MechChev or something and see if that makes it work any better. But for now I've just kind of been wrestling with it a bit. Because, as you can see, it hasn't caused too many super major problems because we're well on track to getting ourselves into orbit. And so, you know, sometimes you don't want the autopilot doing everything for you. The only thing is, when I do ask the autopilot to do something for me, I kind of like it when it does it properly. That's... I think anybody would. You know, I don't think I'm being unreasonable there, but, uh, you know... Nobody's perfect. Sometimes you can't have it all. Now, here we are up at approximately 12,500 kilometers, and we're going to see if we can get this thing to fly around in a circle rather than an ellipse. And again, this, you know, takes a few minutes. Even when, even when the rocket engine has fuel, uh, you know, it manages pretty good acceleration. Uh, it averages approximately 1G over the duration of its burn, which is not bad for a little satellite. I mean, you don't need 2, 3, 4G acceleration when you're already way out in space. That's... what's the point? Generally, you end up just bringing a bigger, heavier rocket engine to do that anyway. And then we switch to RCS because we do run out of fuel. And I think the next design update on this probe is I'm going to give it a smaller hydrazine tank because given that I'm using all of the RCS fuel to do orbit trimming or orbit establishment or orbit finishing it occurs to me that I, I can probably I've got a 50 I think a 50 liter I believe the standard unit for real fuels uh, and the modular fuel tank kind of system that I use to tell the tank what's in it. I think it's all in liters. So there's 50 in the tank uh, here for hydrazine. So I've thought about maybe dropping it to 25, which will give me about 12.5 liters each of the fuel and oxidizer for the proper engine, uh, which might be enough. It might be a better trade-off than using hydrazine, because the four RCS thrusters on here are together providing about 360 newtons of force. As it is, we get it basically into orbit, and it all works out. And so I'll probably throw a few more of these up, maybe in an episode, maybe I'll just do it in between, get this finished set up, and then maybe the next episode we'll just uh, try that bio sample probe again. 
the meantime, I've been Cerberus, and thanks for watching. Today's episode of Space's Hard Vacuum is brought to you by the number 12,500, and the word of the day is frustration. Happy kerbling.